What's up guys, Sean the Bro here. Today we're going to be working on local multiplayer within our game. So it's pretty much as simple as it seems. You're going to be able to control two players uh, with different inputs on one device. Okay, this is split into two different tutorials. One is the one device only, meaning like keyboard or arcade cabinet where you only have one giant bar to work with. Um, the next episode will be about multiple controllers and things like that. Now, a quick disclaimer, the way we are moving player two, and in fact he can't even jump right now, is a bit awkward. And it will be fixed in the next episode. There's a very specific reason I'm not fixing it now, and it's because we kind of need to go over the concepts in the next episode to make this work. Uh, so, understand, this is more for being able to perform attacks, and, again, I'll give you the the tutorial to actually move your second character but it's not really the right way we should be doing it so he like he can kind of face through walls and stuff so anyway we'll get into it but just know that the next episode will kind of clear up any of the issues we have here but we kind of need to go over those concepts and have two input controllers because unreal is not very happy with controlling multiple things with one input device uh, at least multiple things that are supposed to have the same logic, if that makes sense. You could have one input device control multiple objects, but the same object being assigned to a player controller is weird when you're trying to deal with two different characters. So we'll talk about why that is more in the next episode when we actually have two controllers, but let's get into it for now. So we'll start with the code as we usually do. Uh, what we're gonna do here is basically set up attacks that our, our second player should be able to do uh, that they normally would not be able to do because of the way the setup input player component, uh, yeah, so, sorry, the setup player input component function does things. So what we're doing is normally, and if you have two, two controllers, you'll see that this is the way we're gonna do it. So you don't have to worry about uh, writing this down now. We'll go over this in the next episode. But I just want to show you what I'm talking about. So normally to have multiple players and have different controllers be bound to different controls, you know, if they want different control schemes, you just set up different actions and add something like P2 on the end of it. So we know this is for player 2 or this is for player 1. Since we're working with one input device, for our keyboard in this case, then what we need to do is actually mimic the logic for player two or whatever, however many different players you have. Uh, but what we we want to mimic it without using the player input component. Otherwise, things will get a little bit janky. So what we're gonna do, and I know I say so, what we're gonna do a lot, but you know that's my favorite segue. <laughs> we are going to add basically these functions that are keyboard mode only or keyboard only mode, as I'm referring to them. So there are all the attacks and all the functionality you want the second player to be able to do, but uh, blueprint callable so we can do them from blueprint. Okay, so how this is gonna work. We're going to make functions for attack one through four. You know, these are the four attacks I have. You can see I have four attacks right up above. The jump and the moving. All we're gonna do in the code class is go down to our functions, like set them up, and we're going to call the corresponding function. So P2 keyboard attack one, well, we're just gonna call start attack one. Same with attack two, three, and four. P2 keyboard jump, well, we're gonna call jump. Stop jumping, call stop jumping. Move right, well, we're gonna call move right. Simple enough, right? We're not actually doing any different logic with these. The reason we're doing this, again, is so that we can actually cover them in blueprint, and when we use the input mappings on one device, both players can get access to those keys. So that should be all we're doing in the code. You're just setting up these functions and we're going to uh, call the proper functions. You could also have something like keyboard only mode as a Boolean. And if it's true, only do this logic then. We're gonna do that later, but feel free to implement that now if you're trying to go ahead. Now, in Unreal, what we need to do is go to our character BPs. Our character BPs will have uh, what we need because they will have the proper characters able to perform the actions. So if we go to edit, project settings and input, right here, 
you can see I've set up different input uh, action mappings for player two. So all my stuff for player one is still here. I haven't changed it or anything like that. But I've set up ones that have P2 on the end of them. So I've differentiated player one from player two. Same with the axis mappings. And essentially what these are, are just different keys that'll only be usable by player two. Simple enough, right? Well, when you're in a character BP, and I think when you're in any sort of controller BP, you can use, you can just flat out call an input action, as well as an action mapping. So if you do input action, then you can see here that you can call, you can basically call an event for any of the action mappings we have set up. So for example, I have these right here, input action, jump two, or jump P2, attack one P2, all the attacks, all the move rights. So this is all the player two stuff. Well, the reason we're doing this is because now we can just search for an input and the input will be whatever is bound to the action mappings. So it doesn't stop, it doesn't make us hard code a certain key or something like that. It can be still something that the player binds, but it searches for it. It'll use this player two reference, which we'll talk about how we get in one second. Um, and it will call the corresponding function with the proper character. This is the important part here. This is all well and good. You could do this with player one too. Like this is fine. Uh, but there's no reason to do this for player one. We already have it happening in the code. The reason we're doing this in here is because of the way setup input or setup player input component works. It, it doesn't really allow for two players with the keyboard. Just remember that. That's why we're doing it this way. So uh, to get this player two reference, now we already have this reference several times throughout the, the project. So people who are, you know, longtime viewers of this project will kind of already know how to do this. If you're new and watching for the local multiplayer section, then I'll send you an iCard or I'll show you an iCard in the top right corner right now. And that will kind of get you caught up to speed with the fighting game project if you're interested in joining. If you're just interested in the local, local multiplayer, the important part you need to know here is you'll have a game mode such as a game mode BP or some sort of uh, like I have uh, game mode code files and they should have a player one and player two with references to your default base character class okay which mine is fighter template character there you go and once you have those uh, what you can do is just in begin play on your character cast to your game mode grab player two make a variable hit the little plus, and then type in the default base fighter character thing. Mine's fighter template character. Get an object reference and set the reference to the player two result from the game mode. The rest of this stuff you see in here is stuff we've already done throughout the series. Essentially, it's getting a hurt box, spawning it, and attaching it to the owner so we can take damage. You don't need to worry about that now. That's, that, that's already been covered. I just want to show you what it was. That way you're familiar with it. I do have side scroller character up, just so you know, I did the same thing here. Uh, technically, we usually use the mutant in this episode because I don't have animations for the, the mannequin, but just do this for all the characters that you want to be able to have this functionality. I think that makes sense, so I'm gonna close this guy. Uh, one important thing to know, you should, okay, you should use the code class here. You can create a circular dependency depending on how you set things up. When in begin play, you have player spawns, uh, or when you have player spawns that are attached to characters that are going to be spawned dynamically, like we spawn players here in the game mode BP. Since we spawn them and set them here, it's dangerous to actually cast to the game mode in the characters that we spawned. This can create a circular dependency that, uh, your editor will no longer open if you if you were to cast to the BP version, the blueprint version of this game mode, because the blueprint version will be looking for will be spawning the character, will be spawning the um I'm trying to think of how a, a better way to word it, but basically it's going to spawn your pawn class or your character class, and then the character class right away is going to cast to your game mode. If you do that, it can create an issue and your editor will get stuck at around 71 to 73% forever. If you do that, um, it's not the end of the world. What you can do is copy the game mode or copy this class, the mutant character BP, depending on which one uh, has is actually the culprit, if you will. Paste on your desktop or wherever else, delete it. 
uh, from the original directory in your project. Run it. it, you'll be missing that file obviously, but your project should now open. You can now drag your project that's on your desktop or wherever else you placed it. You can add your, excuse me, you can now drag your, your file that you took out, whether it's your character BP or your game mode BP, back into the directory while the editor is open now. And you know, you'll have to refresh your nodes or it'll say like bad cast on all the casts that you did to your game mode. And you can, you know, just delete it and drag off and cast again like this. And uh, then you can just make sure you remove it and add the code class instead or just set it up different differently entirely. I wanted to mention that we have had a few people run into that issue. So that's important to know. If, you, if you're getting stuck around 71 or 73%, that's probably the issue. You're probably having a circular dependency issue. So uh, if you want help with that, you can feel free to join the Discord if you're not already in it. Um, it's kind of a hard thing to describe and I'm not going to try and force it because it's different depending on how you set up the code and the code flow. So I don't really have a way to show it here, but just know the Discord is in the description. If you want help with that or if you got confused by anything I said, please feel free to join. I'll be happy to help you out as well as a lot of the others in the Discord. So just letting you know that that's a thing. Okay, now that we're through that, uh, just see that when you make these input actions and we, we're using our player2 reference that we now made, you can now call the functions we made in code. And if these aren't shown up, just make sure you build the code so you don't have to be on a certain file, but make sure you build and then come in here and hit compile. Okay. Now you can see the functions that are showing up here that we just wrote, which are, these are all the ones that we, I showed you today that literally just call other functions that already exist. So basically when we press this button, it'll call this function. When we release it, it'll call this function. So for all the ones you don't need release keys for, well, release can be empty. But for jump, for example, like stop jumping, we can have release. So there you go, guys. That's how to do, that'll basically make it so you can do all your attacks um, and control two characters. You won't be able to jump yet, and you won't be able to move yet. Uh, and I'll show you how to make moving work. We're not going to do jumping in this episode because this method is already very janky, if you will. It's very screwed up. Um, not the correct way to go about it, but the reason we're doing it now is so you can move and so you can have something. Some people don't uh, necessarily need to set up the proper way because it depends on what their project requires. For us, I want to set it up the proper way, but we're going to need to delve really deep into kind of how player controllers work and input devices, so we're not going to go over that today. Here's a very simple way to make any character, it can be your player one or player two, move in Blueprint based on keys. So. Keyboard move left P2, keyboard move right P2. These should not be uh, mixed up with my axis mappings. This is my axis mapping. You can still set these up because we're gonna use them next episode. Same with jump. Even though jump isn't implemented right now, you can still set it up. Okay, these are action mappings. These are not the same thing. These are like your attack and things like that. This is left, this is right. What I'm doing is I've made a variable called movement. It's, it is a vector and I'm setting the values that I want to move per second, essentially, when I'm pressing that key. So movement is 500, and then or movement is zero. So if I've released the left key, well, I don't want to be moving at all. If I have the left key pressed, I want to be moving 500 units to the left, right? Same with this. Negative 500 means I'm moving to the right, and if I've released it, I want to be moving zero, because I'm not moving. In event tick, I can get rid of this now. In tick, um, you can have you have delta seconds by default. So if you get momentum, so just drag it in here like this, drag off of it and do times the little asterisk times float. The float will be multiplied through uh, throughout the entire vector, all three values. So for every second that is in here, it will multiply through the movement. So you'll essentially, if this is 10, if this were to be 10 seconds. 500 times 10, there you go. You'd have 5,000. So that's how that works. This basically makes it so we can move over time by holding down that key. So you just drag this over. Uh, well, right click, do add actor world offset right here. Drag in the movement 
multiplication right here into the delta location. And I do a check if is valid because when you're doing anything in tick that requires something that could potentially be null pointer or null, uh, it's very good to do an is valid check since it'll often fire around the same time as begin play. And there you go. This will make it so you can move your character. Again, it's not a terrible way to set this up. Um, in fact, some games entirely use this method. However, the problem is, the real issue is, we're using, we're just changing his offset to make him move, whereas we, we're not actually using any sort of input or player controller, right? We, we will want to do that, and we'll do that in the next episode. So, this is just a very simple way. Hopefully it still teaches you something because you still say, see a way you can move objects. But there are some flaws with it, so. I just wanted to point that out so you could have a working character to play around with for now. All right, guys, so that should be it for this episode. Um, I already mentioned the Discord, so I won't go over that again, but just know it's in the description if you're interested in joining. And uh, if you want to support this channel, seriously, the most important thing you can do is just subscribe. It just lets me know what kind of videos you're looking forward to and what you guys are interested in so I can work on them more in the future. Uh, and lastly, if you would like to see me play anything other than, or do anything other than programming tutorials, I started streaming on Twitch on Sean the Bro 27 if you're interested in joining that little community. Um, we play Dark Souls, Resident Evil, Darwin Project, Apex Legends, all sorts of stuff, so if you're interested, I would appreciate any support, but... If not, well, that's all for today's episode, guys. So I'll see you in the next one where we're doing uh, part two of the movement. So it'll be two separate input controllers and fixing the movement in this one. And next week, we will be back on the Super Smash Brothers tutorial for Friday's episode. Anyway, guys, I'm Sean the Bro, and I'll see you later.